Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the One and L podcast. I'm Joel Haas. I'm Lala Alcian. I'm Lexi Linderman. Today, we're going to be covering a couple of recent commitments for Penn State uh, added to the class of 2025. And then we're also going to touch on some more EA Sports college football rankings that came out recently. Uh, but we'll start with the commitments. So first off, Penn State on the 4th of July picked up a commitment from son of LeVar Arrington, uh, LeVar Arrington II. Um, he plays at the same position as his father. He's a linebacker, three-star uh, recruit in the class of 2020, 2025. I got a chance to look at his film, and um, I saw some shades of LeVar Arrington the first. Um, so some similarities there, just kind of an aggressive play style is how I would best describe it. Um, and I know Lexi got to look at his film as well. So what were you able to see from him? Um, well, obviously he has really big shoes to fill, but it seems like, you know, he could possibly do it. But I mean, super big shoes to fill, but he's a s- small outside linebacker. He's only 213 pounds, I think, um, 213. And so he's definitely going to have to bulk up a little bit before he gets on campus and when he gets on campus. Um, but a lot of his highlights were blitzes and sacks and everything like that. So um, which is interesting for an outside linebacker. So maybe we'll see him in that role more like a blitzing role more at Penn State but yeah it's interesting you know following in his dad's footsteps um I'm sure it's good for Penn State fans to see picking up that commitment especially all the way in California to uh, I think that's their sec- second in the 2025 class from California which they hadn't had anyone from California since like I think 2014 or something so you know big big for that too but yeah he's a great blitzer and but he, he has big shoes for like, he's a bulk up and yeah I think it's interesting to see like what it's going to be when he gets on campus. Cause first of all, all the other NIL opportunities is you can do so much with him just because of his dad. And we know what Penn State's NIL looks like right now. So at least see if they can actually capitalize on that or any local state college things. But another thing is that I wonder how hard they pursued him. Cause obviously he had the offer and I think it's not just thrown out there just because of his dad, but I think he's actually a talented player. He had, other power for schools like Tennessee, UCLA, those are his three finalists, I believe. But it's also like, I wonder if they pursued him harder with DJ McClary flipping to Rutgers because they only had two linebackers in the class with Burnett and Tash. So I think it was important for them to get another one on board. But I wonder how much they like actually believe in him to like fill that spot because McClary was the highest rated linebacker in the class. And obviously you're putting a lot of pressure on him with his name. And I don't think he's shying away from that because obviously you're walking into a situation where you're your dad's a Hall of Famer who played for the same school, but I think he. I think part of his process was he said he was like, I don't want to be like be like looked at as like my dad's kid. You know, I want to be remembered for my own player. So I think he's got the confidence. I think he's ready. He knows what he's walking into. So I'll be interested to see how he does when he gets to campus. Yeah, I mean, I I personally don't think this is one of those cases of like nepotism where it's like you know your dad was a legend here, so we'll you know we'll go ahead and offer you. Um, and then you can ride the bench for four years. I think this is like a legitimate recruitment where it's like they really wanted this guy. Um, I mean, we can all remember like back when you're playing t-ball and like the coach's son is the starting pitcher every game. <laughs> it's like he's a you know twelve point four ERA, and it's like why are we throwing this guy out there to start every game? But I, I don't think this is like one of those situations. Like I think this was a legitimate recruitment, like you mentioned. Um, I mean, pretty highly rated. Uh, on the higher end as far as three stars go and then you know pursued by some other big name power four schools um so he definitely had interest in other options and i i do think this was a legitimate recruitment where they do expect him to be a contributor in the future um but moving on to penn state's second commitment of the week uh this one more recent uh coming in yesterday from um defensive tackle randy adarica the first defensive tackle to join penn state's class He's listed as a three-star currently, and Lyle, I know you got to look at his film. What did you see from from Randy? Yeah, so I think this was a good get. Good, being keyword. Um, just because that's the first defensive tackle of the class. Obviously, Deion Barnes has got the three defensive ends that he's landed, all pretty high-caliber players, all being four-stars. And he's a solid player. I mean, coming from Miami, teammates with 2025 quarterback commit, Beckham Kritza, so they had that connection. But and I think he's really physical. I think you could see that in the way he's like d- disruptive up the middle, you know, forces t- turnovers, tackle for loss. I think that was a big one he racked up during his junior year. But also it's like he's only weighs more than Liam Andrews, I think, of the current Penn State defensive tackle room. And obviously 
only a three star. And I think the only other defensive tackle that we're looking at right now, Wednesday, July 10th, 618 is just Jarquez Carter, who is um, higher rated. I think that's going to be an important target for Deion Barnes. I think he, right now he's another Florida guy. He's between, I think, Florida, UCF, Ohio State, and Penn State. So I think, obviously, Randy, that's a good pickup. I don't really know how much time it's going to see or down the line even, because I'm pretty sure in the 2024 class they've got four defensive tackles on board. But I think that's a nice get. Obviously, it's important to pick up every single position during a recruiting cycle. So I think it's nice that they got a defensive tackle on board. Yeah, I agree. I think getting a def- like their first defensive tackle could be huge. It could get the ball rolling. You might see a couple more or something. Um, but yeah, and getting someone from Florida. I mean, most guys from Florida shape out to be pretty good. So hopefully the same is here for Randy. But um, yeah, I don't – I mean, I looked at his film a little bit. And he seems like a pretty, pretty good player, but nothing like insane, too special. But, you know, maybe he'll see some playing time. Maybe he won't. But years from now, we'll see. So, yeah, I think the biggest thing for him is he does have good size right now. Um, Being only a junior in high school going into his senior year, um, he's still got time to fill out that frame. But he's he's at 275 right now, um, which obviously you want your defensive tackles to be around that 300 or even higher range. Um, and I think he does have time to grow into that and he could be a contributor eventually here um, if he can get, you know, up to the 300 range. But yeah, obviously a nice piece for Deion Barnes. And like you mentioned, Lyle, the first defensive tackle to hop on board in the class. So it was obviously, obviously important to get him here because, you know, we're starting to get to the end of the class and you don't want to have any, you know, gaps where you're missing, you know, players at a specific position. Um, so Penn State now up to 22 players, 22 commitments in that. 2025 class as of now we all we always know you know things can change they can add commitments they can lose commitments um in the blink of an eye but right now 22 commitments they're currently the number nine class in the 247 sports composite rankings um so kind of fighting to finish with a top 10 class or there's been a lot of movement uh, kind of back and forth as things heat up on the recruiting trail um with other teams just leapfrogging each other but moving on from recruiting ea sports dropped some more rankings so of course we have to react to them um, today, or at least the day of recording, they released their top 100 player rankings. Penn State had uh, three players included on those rankings. Um, so we had Abdul Carter coming in as the number 48 overall player, KJ Winston at 58, and then Nick Singleton at 65, um, which I thought, honestly, the the rankings for Carter and Singleton were pretty low. Um especially the ranking for Singleton. And then when you dig deeper into it, uh, Singleton's strength rating was 83, which I kind of thought was too low, um, just given what we've seen from him in the weight room. Penn State had their max max out session this spring, and you know, media members were invited to attend that. We got to see him repping 570 pounds um, squatting, which was you know more than anyone else that we saw that day. Um, I mean, that was more than the offensive linemen who were repping and things like that. Um, so I think 83 out of 100 is a little bit low there for a strength rating. Um, but I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts on the rankings? I think if we're looking at – we're just talking about Singleton. I'm not disagreeing where he's at, but I think wherever you put him in that range of 20 plus or minus, whatever, you got to throw Katron in there just because, obviously, Katron was the better running back last year. I mean, I don't – I feel pretty comfortable saying that. And I, when I say better, I mean he was the 1A, right, and Singleton was 1B. So I just – and you look at it from their freshman year, obviously Singleton had his had the role right away, and Katron just like slowly – when I say slowly, I mean it was like two or three games he replaced Kayvon Lee. But it's like they've been Batman and, and Batman, not even Batman and Robin, just their whole – through the time at Penn State. So, and obviously they do their things differently. That's why they're perfect complements for each other. But I think – if you're going to put Singleton wherever he is in the top 100, even if you view him as the better running back, which I'm totally okay with, I don't think you could put Ketron that far behind him. So if Ketron's like in that low 100 to 110 range, I don't know if we're going to be able to see those kind of like numbers when everyone comes out. I won't know. I'll be like, okay, fine. But if it's that, that much of a fluctuation between the two, then that's where I'll have a bit of a problem. Yeah, because, I mean, Penn State prides themselves on their 1A, 1B running back duo that they have currently. And so with Nick being 68, yeah, it is kind of surprising that Katron didn't crack the top 100, especially because they've been dominating together the past year. Like, it isn't Nick dominating 
like entirely like it's both of them like they're working together and they say that all the time too so it's a little surprising that Katron's the top 100 but I kind of expected it I mean when you look at the running back room I mean everyone points to Nick Singleton first you know the athletic freak the speedster like all that but I mean Katron's like that too but you know it's not surprising it's I mean Penn State fans know that they're kind of like a 1A 1B but I don't know if like the whole college football landscape is kind of aware of that so I think it makes sense that Nick is at 16 and Katron they cracked the top 100. And I think 68 is pretty good for Nick. Um, considering I think he had a pretty a down year last year compared to his freshman season. Um, so hopefully, you know, or yeah, hopefully for him, he'll like take those bullets and board material because he said before, you know, all the rankings, everything, the running back room uses that as motivation. So maybe he'll use that as motivation, have another big year like his freshman year. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone who follows Penn State um even a little bit kind of use them as like you know the traditional you know lightning and thunder duo at running back um and you can't really have lightning without thunder but according to yeah you can <laughs> um i can see lyle could you get that that might have not that might not have been my best line but um other issues i had with this game i just want to point out or these rankings i just want to point out that colorado according to ea we saw we saw last week and we talked about it. They were given the number twenty overall team ranking, which is just like that's not going to happen. If Colorado finishes this season ranked inside the top twenty, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do something. Like, I'm gonna have to get a tattoo or something. I don't know what. We'll figure it out. But I'll do something if Colorado finishes in the top twenty because it's not going to happen. They're going to go five and seven. But Colorado also had the number one ranked quarterback, Jitter Sanders, and then they also had the number one ranked uh, wide receiver and Travis Hunter in the video game. Um, and I don't know if either of them are, like, top five at their respective positions. So I also kind of had a problem with that. I mean, like, okay, if you look at the Travis Hunter, I got the Travis Hunter rating just because of the both sides of the ball. Okay, well, well, Travis Hunter, I think, is a better cornerback than wide receiver. So him being the number one wide receiver, and I don't think he's the number one cornerback in the game. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, because like, it's Will Johnson. I mean, yeah. I, it's Travis Hunter, though. That's all I got to say about that. I mean, both, both sides of the law, he's ridiculous. Like, I think whether you're justifying where he fits in at his position or not, I think that rating makes sense for him, considering how elite he is at both. But this is a Penn State podcast. I mean, Joel, you can transition this however you want, but... I don't know, man. I think they're so overrated. Like, I don't know what kind of deal Colorado has. They must be, like, sending some NIL money to EA or something like that to get all these all these rankings bumped up. Um but yeah, just completely overrated. I just had to mention that, even though we're supposed to be covering Penn State right now, I just I just had to mention that that's that's terrible. Abdul Carter had a problem with his rating, and I agree with him because if you're looking at him as a consensus projected lottery pick at this point of the season, I think 91. I yeah, okay, whatever. I'm like you could point fingers, whatever. I'm like nitpicking here. 91. I would move him up a little bit, considering he's. You're looking at mocks and you see him going no later than like right outside the lottery. So I think at that, you're looking at minimum 94, 95. And then, you know, obviously, you know, sure, he's moving from linebacker to defensive end. Take that way you want. Yeah, your ratings adjusters doesn't make a difference to me because he's that talented. But you know what? He took to his ex. He's ready to prove some people wrong. He wants that rating to go up. And I, I'm right there with him. I think he can do it. Yeah, I think he's he's probably going to prove the the Raiders wrong. I think that he's he's poised for a big year. And I think that this is just more motivation for him, even though it's just, you know, the EA Raiders deciding overalls and everything like that. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely a little low. He's um, far and away probably the best player on Penn State's roster at this moment. And they didn't really rank him as such, considering Penn State's like a projected top 10 team. So that was just kind of surprising. But I'm sure we'll see him move up as the year goes on because he's going to have a big year no matter what so yeah I mean they put him at 47 so he was the the highest out of Penn State's you know players in this ranking he'll be the highest ranked Penn State player on the team um but yeah I mean I think we've seen he's pretty much been a first rounder in at least every mock draft that I've seen um so for him to be outside the top 32 um you know a little bit puzzling there all right so we're going to get into some hot takes that were submitted uh, by some of you guys on Twitter. Um, first off, from Will Gamble, Drew Aller explodes this season with Koto Nikki calling plays and is a Heisman finalist. So basically, um, do we think Drew Aller will be a Heisman finalist this season? Um, 
And again, I mean, it's a hot take for a reason. I think it's more of an unpopular opinion um, that most people wouldn't really anticipate Aller finishing as a Heisman finalist, um, you know, being one of those top four players in college football. But I mean, what do you guys think are, are the chances of this happening? Not high. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think Drew should take strides um, with Kodal Nicky at the helm, at the helm. And I mean, Julian Fleming there now, hopefully some better wide receivers for him to throw to. But at the end of the day, I don't think he the offense is going to be good enough for him to be a Heisman finalist. I don't think he's going to be good enough to be a Heisman finalist. Um, yeah, I also think, like, Nick Singleton has, like, a better chance of being a Heisman finalist just because, <laughs> just because of what I've heard from, you know, like, all the – like running like he's he's gonna he's gonna pop off this year like I can I can sense it but yeah I think I don't think he's gonna be a Heisman finalist but I think he's gonna be better than last year my short answer is no however I do see a world where it happens but I don't think it's gonna happen I just think realistically if you're looking at if Drew to be in the running you need 11 and 1 when this offense like obviously I think it's gonna take strides just compared if Cool Nicky backfires at all, and this offense looks worse than your stitch, then there's a serious problem. But I mean, I think the offense just needs to be that good. Drew needs to be that guy. The receivers need to step up, and you need everything to fall into place for Drew to have that run, which could happen. I mean, I'm not going to say no, but I just think he's not even on paper the best quarterback in the Big Ten right now. And shout out to Dylan Gabriel, Oregon quarterback, Oklahoma transfer. That was a great performance by him to be Texas in that game last year. Earned himself a fan. But I just, you know, I think you need the offense needs to be perfect for him to go do that. So is there a shot? Yes. Do I think it's going to happen? No. Yeah. And unfortunately, Penn State doesn't play Oregon. It's the only incoming Pac-12 school that Penn State won't play. So we won't get to see the Aller gabriel head-to-head matchup. Um, yeah, I mean, I tend to lean no. But again, it's a hot take for a reason. It's because it's probably pretty unlikely. Um, but again, I don't think it's, you know, outside of the realm of possibility. Um, we'll move to our second prediction here from Will Horseman, who says that Penn State, think with me here, is going to go nine and three this season. They're going to lose to West Virginia, USC, and Ohio State. They're going to finish number 13 in the college football playoff poll, and then they're going to miss out on the playoffs by one spot. So it's kind of a lot to unpack there. First of all, I, I think I agree about the USC and Ohio State losses. If I had to pick right now, I think those are Penn State's two losses. I don't see Penn State losing to West Virginia. Um, just because of, you know, how lopsided that game was last year with a 38 to 15 final. And that was after Penn State missed a couple chip shot field goals. The score could have been, you know, the gap could have been a little bit bigger there. Um, I think Penn State wins again pretty comfortably. Um, I think the line has changed a little bit since, uh, when it opened, but Penn State still, I believe is a 10 point favorite as of right now. And, um, if I had to pick right now, I think they cover that spread. So I think Penn State beats West Virginia pretty comfortably. Um, and, you know, so according to me, they go 10-2, and two, make the college football playoff. Um, but where do you guys see Penn State going? I, 9-3, and three, I, I don't see them not going 10-2, and two, just based off of the fact that with this caliber team, regardless of what happens, they're always going to go 10-2, and, two. and but also just because of the schedule. I mean, I think the three teams that will WVU, USC, and Ohio State – I think I pushed WVU behind Wisconsin for the highest probability of a loss. Not because I think on paper, WVU is definitely a way better team, but I just think Wisconsin on the road is just seems like the kind where Penn State is just looks like a way better team is the kind of game that if Penn State's going to blow a game this year, it's going to be to Wisconsin. And honestly, to me, I'm not really worried about USC that much. I think that game is getting overhyped. I, I think obviously. For the reason it can, whatever. Obviously, you saw what that team did last year, even in that bowl game without Caleb Williams. Like, the offense is legit. Obviously, this is the first time Penn State's going to head out to the West Coast. So, it's got all the right reasons, but I do not pack 12, or I know not a thing anymore, but there's no defense in that conference. And if they could go out and make a statement against Penn State's offense, who we'll see what we'll, they look like at that point of the season, they can prove something, like, go for it. I mean, obviously, they got a new defensive coordinator, Dan Lynn, former Penn State cornerback. So we'll see if that does anything. But, like, I don't really see a world where they go, not don't go 10-2. and two. They could still miss the playoff in theory at 10-2 because there's so many implications down the road. 
but I think they're going to go 10 and two. We'll see about the playoff. I think they make it, but. I honestly think they have a good chance to go 11 and one. Um, like Lyle, I'm not worried about the USC game. I mean, obviously it's their first um, cross country trip, but I mean, if they couldn't really do that much with Caleb Williams, like quarterback, I don't think, you know, it's going to be that big of a problem for Penn State this year with Caleb Williams gone. Um, and I think they win the West Virginia game, too. I think they lose to Ohio State. But honestly, I could see them losing to Wisconsin, like Lyle said, just because of the road trip and everything. But I honestly, like, they should win, like, all those games. And I honestly think they can. I honestly think they will. So I honestly could see 11-1 and one and obviously a playoff berth. I don't think 9-3 and three is – possible at all I mean it is possible obviously but I don't think it's going to happen I think 10 and 2 is probably the floor for them this year if Penn State goes 9 and 3 I think Frank okay no this is this is my hot take I think Frank was <laughs> gone I think he should be gone but that's you know he won't be gone but I have no power in making that happen or any say in that wait are you predicting did you predict 9 and 3 or 10 and 2 no I said 10 and 2 I said 10 and 2 no I think you and I are in the same boat with like 10 and 2. Just the Penn State curse of he's 10 and 2. Um, like to see a little bit more confident with 11 and 1, which would potentially position them for uh, one of the higher seeds, maybe a home playoff game or even a first round bye if they can squeak into the top four. But um, yeah, so to answer the question, I mean, that is a hot take. Um, I think that is a hot take. 9 and 3, especially the loss to West Virginia. Um, if it happens, it would be a very good prediction. And I wouldn't be too surprised. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't expect that to happen, at least the way things stand right now. Um, I think Penn State will be prepared for West Virginia. Um, you guys kind of touched on it. USC losing Caleb Williams, and they only went 7-6 and six last year, so it's not like they were a juggernaut. I do know that that spread is pretty pretty small right now. I think it's like a three-point spread with Penn State being slight favorites on the road. Um, so it could be, you know, a little bit of a trap game there. It's also in the middle of a tough stretch um, in the middle of the, of the season. But, yeah, I mean, I think outside of Ohio State, you know, there are a couple toss-ups. I don't think Penn State loses more than two games this season. Mm. But that's it for today's episode. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, for more football coverage, you can find us at psucollegian.com. You can follow us on socials. We'll see you next time.